Okay, well, why don't we get started? Um, I thank all of you for coming and braving the snow today. And for all of you online, I hope you are staying safe and warm uh, today. So we are very delighted to have um, a outstanding uh, speaker, Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld, who will be introduced by our own Dr. Amy Kind. So Amy. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us and thanks for joining us online. I know we have a lot of listeners online. So it's my just wonderful, wonderful privilege and pleasure to introduce Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld. Dr. Ehrenfeld was elected president-elect of the American Medical Association in June of 2022. He's a senior associate dean and tenured professor of anesthesiology and director of the Advancing Healthier Wisconsin Endowment at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I have the great pleasure of working very closely with Dr. Ehrenfeld uh, as he is my counterpart because our version of that endowment is the Wisconsin Partnership Program. He was elected to the American Medical Association Board of Trustees in 2014, and he divides his time amongst clinical practice, teaching and research, uh, directing the AHW endowment. He also has an appointment as an adjunct professor of anesthesiology and health policy at Vanderbilt and an adjunct professor of surgery at the Uniform Sur Services University of the Health Sciences in Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Ehrenfeld is a consultant to the World Health Organization Digital Health Technology Advisory Group and previously served as a co-chair of the Navy Surgeon General's tax Task Force on Personalized Digital Medicine and as a special advisor to the 20th U.S. Surgeon General. Dr. Ehrenfeld's research focuses on understanding how information technology can improve surgical safety and patient outcomes. He has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and many other groups. He currently serves on the National Academy of Medicine's Health Policy Fellowships and Leadership Programs Advisory Committee. Dr. Ehrenfeld is so accomplished. He has published more than 275 peer-reviewed manuscripts. He's editor-in-chief of the Journal of Medical Systems and has co-authored 22 clinical textbooks. He has received numerous, numerous awards, more than uh, I can read out here. But for the past two decades, Dr. Ehrenfeld has advocated on behalf of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals. In 2018, in recognition of his outstanding research contributions, he received the inaugural Sexual and Gender Minority Research Investigator Award from the director of the NIH. Um, so Dr. Ehrenfeld is a graduate of Phillips Academy, Haverford College, the University of Chicago, and Harvard. He completed an internship in internal medicine, residency in anesthesiology, and a research informatics fellowship at Mass General. He's board certified in both anesthesiology and clinical informatics. He is also a combat veteran who deployed to Afghanistan during both Operation Enduring Freedom and Resolute Support Mission. Dr. Ehrenfeld for his work in capturing and supporting the lives of LGBTQ people was recognized in 2015 with a White House News Photographers Association Award and in 2016 with an Emmy nomination. Uh, I don't know if we've ever had an Emmy nominee come speak to Grand Rounds. So Dr. Ehrenfeld and his husband, Judd, have a son, Ethan, and just had another son who has joined their family. So please give a very, very warm welcome to our illustrious speaker today, Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld. Is my microphone on? You can hear me okay, perfect. So the most important thing for you all that didn't make it into the bio, um, I did an internship in medicine and then went over to anesthesia, but I did run for 10 years a primary care clinic in the Navy. Uh, and the good thing is that I had a lot of um, medicine colleagues on speed dial um, who I could consult when I ran into issues I didn't know what to do with, because I do think that actually working in primary care is still one of the most challenging fields in the profession. And so I am, am grateful for those of you um, who have committed your professional careers um, to that space. Um, I'll go through the disclosure slides. I don't think there's anything that we need to dwell on here. Um, really appreciate uh, Dr. Kind, the Department of Medicine, and obviously the entire Center for Health Disparities Research for inviting me to join you this morning. I titled my talk, Advancing Equity Through Digital Technology, Health Policy, and Leadership, which is really a one-line description of my professional portfolio. Um, and so what I'd like to do in the time that we've got this morning is to kind of come at this from three perspectives. 
Um, first, you know, my view as somebody who is um, a clinician, board certified in informatics with sort of a deep knowledge of the tools and technologies that are driving the digital health revolution that we and our patients are experiencing. Second, my perspective as a gay dad whose children have both been direct beneficiaries of some of the technologies that have markedly changed how we both practice and deliver equitable care. And third, um, my view from a policy perspective on kind of the regulatory framework for emerging technologies, um, primarily uh, driven by my work uh, at the American Medical Association where I'm now president elect. So along the way, I'll, I'll sort of sprinkle some anecdotes to hopefully personalize the discussion, be delighted to engage with the audience both online and in person um, and give you some insight into kind of my career journey into this space. So to accomplish this in, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, um, let me give you a quick overview of the AMA as an entry point into how I come into this uh, broader topic of trying to use digital tools to ad advance health equity. Um, I have no conflicts of interest that are relevant. Um, and my three learning objectives explain how digital technologies will impact healthcare delivery, summarize the role of advocacy in changing health policy, and I want you to all walk out with a clear understanding of the phrase augmented, not artificial intelligence. And I make that distinction uh, very intentionally. So um, Dr. Kine gave a, a very um, generous introduction. Um, this is my 57 page CV on one slide. Um, and so a lot of my engagement um, in the policy space has been around how can we create a regulatory framework that allows for these technologies to work for clinicians who end up having to use them and our patients who theoretically are benefiting from them? And so there's a variety of things that I'm still involved in um, that really are in that space. Um, I was recruited from uh, Vanderbilt three and a half years ago um, to lead the Advancing Health Care Wisconsin Endowment, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. Um, uh, but still maintain a faculty appointment uh, in, in Nashville and have a few trainees on K awards that I mentor um, remotely. Um, and then because of my military experiences and service, I've had a faculty appointment at the Uniformed Services University. By the way, um, for junior faculty who might be listening or in the audience, when I got my adjunct appointment at the Uniformed Services University, um, they brought me in as a full professor. And I was only an associate professor at Vanderbilt. So I went to the dean at Vanderbilt. I said, well, geez, you know, what do you think about this? And he said, not a chance. Um, he still made, me, still made me wait. But every now and then you can find some external leverage, which can be helpful. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I have the pleasure of um, sort of being uh, Dr. Kine's uh, collaborator uh, in Milwaukee, leading the Advancing a Healthier Wisconsin Endowment. Um, like the partnership program, we first started making awards in 2004 and have been able to invest $333 million across the state into something north of 560 projects. Um, the split is two thirds into our research and education portfolio, a third into public and community health. And we have been able to leverage these dollars uh, in some really fantastic ways for our competitive investigator initiated activities um, we get 200% return on investment in follow-on funding from the NIH and other um, external sources, which we're, we're very proud of and see as a way to accelerate and multiply uh, the impact of, of these dollars. Um, and uh, of course, if you have ever seen a um, turtle sitting on top of a fence post, you know that it didn't get there by itself. Um, and this is the team that actually does the day-to-day -day work. Um, and I have the incredible privilege um, of leading this group um, of folks who have deep expertise in, in grants management, communications, um, public health, compliance, who actually um, make the magic happen on a daily basis. And I, I like to just acknowledge them um, because every day they show up to work to try to help us improve the health of Wisconsin. So with that as a quick background, um, my core research interests really sort of fall in, into four area. The primary focus of my portfolio has been understanding how to use technology to drive quality, safety, and reliability. Um, now, clinical decision support tools, how they're developed, how they get deployed, how do we use AI in clinical workflows, 
uh, the development and implementation of large scale pragmatic trials and how do we do all these things with a health equity lens really um, are at the cornerstone of what I've dedicated really the last 20 years of, of my career to. To give you a sense of what's been in that portfolio, um, these were the most recent grants that I had prior to um, mostly stepping away from active um, uh, research in the funded portfolio. Um, and it's an interesting mix, right? So you can see some sort of foundational informatics development work funded by DOD. Um, you can see some interesting work around health equity and access to dental care funded by Robert Wood Johnson um, and a variety of things along the way that sort of um, have allowed me to really think about how do we not just develop technologies, how do we use technologies to define the evidence that we need that define gaps in care, then how do we use technology to actually bring care to the patients um, who uh, desperately need it. So um, I'll only show uh, two papers of the output of that work um, that again, hopefully give you a flavor of kind of um, where a lot of this has been. The paper on the left-hand side, um, anesthesiology is the flagship journal um, in the field. Um, and I, I, I got the cover. My mom has the cover in a frame at home uh, where she lives, uh, which I highly recommend if you ever get the opportunity to do that. Um, and, and this was a, 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 an implementation science effort using decision support to drive better perioperative outcomes in diabetic patients with impaired um, glucose tolerance. Um, and the whole gestalt of this paper was, you know, it turns out that routine, regular practice um, was allowing the majority of patients with diabetes to have unmeasured glucose while they were asleep during surgery. You can imagine how um, that is not the best interest of those patients. And so uh, this was an effort to try to you know, use technology to make that better. And we were able to demonstrate some really nice improved outcomes, but this was at its core, a systems design project using technology as the backstop. Um, the other two papers, um, which are a pair published in the Union Journal, um, were the output of a large scale pragmatic trial. And again, I, I don't have time to go into the details and it's a little off topic from the health equity angle, um, but these were trials to answer the foundational question of which is better in the ICU and critically ill patients, lactated ringers or normal saline. And there are lots of reasons why that has been a question um, of some debate um, driven by a lot of our understanding of potential for things like um, renal injury. Um, but this was a trial where we enrolled every adult ICU patient at Vanderbilt using our technology stack and infrastructure in the back end and then clinical decision support to drive uh, the fluid selection choice. Um, and we were able to do this with a waiver from our IRB because we were able to demonstrate equipoise, but it's a demonstration of how we can use technology to define the evidence uh, on the front end that can ultimately then hopefully lead to implementation on the back end. So anyway, just a, a flavor of what's been in my portfolio. Let me now turn to the AMA. What is the AMA? Who is this guy who's the president who's come to Madison today to talk to all of you? The AMA is the largest, oldest physician organization in the nation. It's a 175 year old institution. We just had our 175th um, birthday this past year. Um, and it has been an important steward um, of a number of activities that really define the profession. Um, one of which goes back to the very founding meeting, the code of medical ethics. Um, and uh, that still articulates many of the values that guide the professional practice of the medicine today. Um, but the thing that I love about the AMA is it is truly a democratic organization. It convenes the House of Medicine, 190 plus state and specialty societies from ACP, the Wisconsin Medical Society to anesthesia to surgery um, to democratically select what our policy positions will be. Um, and these policy decisions are incredibly influential um, when our leadership, including myself, then work with um, the administration the White House, Congress, um, and all of the agencies at the federal level um, to execute policy change. And you look back at that 175 year history and there's some really, really extraordinary things that have had a deep impact on public health, health equity, things like uh, our initiatives around smoking, smoking reduction, vaccinations, opioid, uh, automobile safety, and a lot of work around COVID-19 over the last three years. So that's, that's the AMA. When you look at all of the activities uh, that the association undertakes, 
um, you can really think about them being in focused in, in three core areas, getting rid of the obstacles that interfere with us taking care of patients every day, things that are painful like prior authorization and a lot of the regulatory challenges that suck the joy out of the practice of medicine, um, leading the charge to confront public health crises, uh, and then trying to drive the future of medicine through our innovation accelerators and thinking about the future of um, medical education. Now, as president of the AMA, my priorities are those of the organization, right? Um, the democratically selected policies um, are what I have the opportunity to go and represent. When I speak to Congress, when I'm on TV with Wolf Blitzer, I'm representing what those policies are, not Jesse Ehrenfeld's personal opinions. But each leader, right, is able to have an impact on the priorities based on his or her unique sets of experiences. And as one of the youngest people to hold the office of AMA president, as the first LGBTQ person to hold the office of AMA president, as the first AMA president to have a child while in AMA president, my experiences in medicine, my passion to be a champion for health equity, a champion for the development of technologies that work for all of our patients, deeply influence my perspectives and my work in representing physicians uh, across uh, the nation. And I don't really have time to get into a, a deep discussion about kind of all of that work at the AMA in the health equity space. Um, but I grabbed a couple of photos at the top there that represent a, a little taste of the engagement in that space. On the left, um, there was a bunch of work that the AMA led and I was involved in around marriage equality. We know that there are health benefits tied to policy decisions around having access to marriage for LGBTQ people. Um, that's an interesting story. Again, I don't have time to get into it. I ended up getting banned from TV. Um, my husband and I and the dog got turned into one of those BuzzFeed gifts. Um, which you can find online, it's amazing. Um, but obviously an important thing uh, when marriage equality was ultimately um, able to be uh, brought forward across, uh, across the country. Uh, the next photo is one that I love. Um, I, I think I look good in it, but more importantly are the people sitting next to me. Um, and this was um, a congressional hearing around the medical advisability of transgender individuals serving in the military. Um, and I was there to talk about the science, the evidence, the AMA positions on it. Um, I've got my LGBTQ health textbook that we wrote sitting in front of me. Um, but beside me are five of the most courageous individuals that I have ever encountered, five openly trans individuals, active duty individuals, first time an active duty transgender individual had testified in Congress. And you can imagine the challenges that they um, have faced and faced after stepping up uh, in a very courageous way to share uh, their, their experiences and their stories. Um, the next photo is actually me taking care of a patient in Afghanistan who happened to be transgender. We have become very good friends uh, and he is happy to have that photo shared. It's been published in a number of uh, media outlets. Um, and ultimately that got turned into a documentary and a full featured film, uh, hence the, the Emmy nomination that was um, mentioned earlier. Now, um, none of those moments along my professional journey, technology, health equity, would have been possible without the support of my leadership at the department level and the places I've worked, um, my mentors in the AMA, um, which have all been key foundational elements to my ability to work in, in this space. Um, so among the top priorities today for the AMA um, are our recovery plan. How do we get beyond COVID to support the nation's physicians? How do we fight rampant misinformation online? And how do we create a more equitable healthcare system uh, ensuring effective innovation in, in digital health? And so I'll, I'll really cover uh, in the remainder of my time today um, those, those items. So a lot of my time now, um, as I think about, you know, what do we need to do beyond COVID um, is to think about how do we, how do we recover? And, and this is a difficult time. It's a difficult time to enter. It's a difficult time to be a part of the medical profession. Um, we all understand the tremendous toll that the pandemic has taken on society and particularly all of us who, who work in healthcare. 
And while I hope that the worst of COVID is behind us, um, we know that this virus will continue to be a major public health threat for the foreseeable future. 400 people are dying every day in the US still today, three years into this experience. But as we emerge from the pandemic, um, the AMA has introduced what we're calling our recovery plan for America's physicians that we think will go a long way to creating the kind of healthcare system that better supports all patients and physicians. And so there, there are five priorities. Um, I won't get into this too much, but reform what we think is a deeply flawed Medicare payment system, fix prior authorization, support physician-led team-based care, advance telehealth and reduce physician burnout, addressing the stigma around needing mental health support. Um, if you're interested in those things, you can scan the QR code. Um, and again, I won't go into the specifics this morning, but just know that each of those five areas of reform are major advocacy priorities for the AMA, both at the federal and the state level. So how do we create a more equitable healthcare future? Um, this can only be done by working in partnership with others to ensure that all people, all communities have the opportunities, the resources, the conditions, and the power to reach their full health potential. So to advance health equity, and that's that goal, the AMA created um, something called our Center for Health Equity. And the goal here, and this is a very aggressive effort, is to eliminate longstanding inequities within our healthcare system caused by structural racism remove barriers to care, improve outcomes for historically marginalized and minoritized populations. And we're working towards equity across the association in every area, in our policies, in our legislative proposals that we advocate for, in the programs we support, and in our work to promote diversity within the profession. So in 2019, we created a new center which is a hub for all of this work, our Center for Health Equity. Um, and to date, they have done some phenomenal work. There are a couple of things that are listed on the slide. I'm particularly proud of our Medical Justice and Advocacy Fellowship. It's in partnership with Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, a number of things that we've done directly to try to improve health outcomes for underserved communities are Release the Pressure National Campaign with Essence around trying to improve heart health for Black women. Um, the list goes on and on. And there's a strategic plan behind all of this um, that really has at its core a number of things, including technology. Um, this was released in the spring of 2021. And the whole idea was how do we embed racial justice and advanced health equity in everything that we do? Um, and so the plan has five strategic approaches to tackling these really, really big challenges embedding equity and racial justice throughout the organization, building alliances with marginalized physicians and other stakeholders, trying to push upstream to address determinants of health and the causes of inequities, ensuring equitable structures and opportunities for innovation and foster pathways for truth and reconciliation and healing. And so I'll focus really now on this sort of digital technology piece and how can we use digital technology to ensure health equity. So what does the digital health revolution really mean for, for medicine? And, and what does it mean for our quest to eliminate health disparities? Clearly, one of the most defining characteristics of practicing medicine today is the rapidly evolving technology environment and its impact on clinical care. If you look at the present and the future of medicine, there are so many formidable challenges for us, for physicians, for the healthcare system to confront. We're seeing all of the digitization across healthcare and business, continued rise and burden of chronic disease. There are 1.5 million people in Wisconsin who are pre-diabetic today. That means that if we don't do something, another 1.5 million adults in Wisconsin, probably in the next 10 years, will have diabetes. We all understand what that means for our systems. Major public health threats like COVID, aging population, increasingly diverse patient populations that have different needs, growth in remote patient care, and then uh, AI. We will increasingly need to rely on advances in technologies if we're going to tackle these challenges. That's the only way that we will have hope. Now, as we know, digital technologies, whether it's wearables, uh, AI, offer almost limitless potential to transform healthcare, not only 
in how we practice, but how our patients experience it. But without the direct input, guidance from physicians in the earliest stages of conception and design through implementation, far many of these technologies will fail to deliver. Or worse, they will further complicate healthcare or make it worse for patients and physicians. We really should all be working towards the quadruple aim, improving patient care, clinician well-being, lowering costs, and having better outcomes for patients. And if new technologies, digital technologies, aren't designed to accomplish at least one of these goals, and hopefully more than one, I would ask, what are they, what are they for? Now, since 2016, we've surveyed uh, 1,300 physicians um, in regular intervals to understand motivations and requirements for integrating digital health into practice. Um, and in September, so just a few months ago, um, we released the latest results from 2022, um, really understanding what are changes over the last three years now that we have been uh, living with COVID and a lot of uh, impetus for remote technologies. What you can see is that there's been an increase in the number of physicians that see an advantage in using digital tools. Adoption of digital tools has grown significantly regardless of the gender, specialty, or age of the physician. And that is a change from what we saw from 2016 to 2019. Plans for adoption of the most emerging technologies are high, but usage is low. Nearly one in five are currently using augmented intelligence for practice efficiencies. Two in five plan to adopt these kinds of emerging technologies in the next year. And nearly three in five physicians believe that technology can help in key areas like chronic disease management and preventive care. The growth in enthusiasm has largely been concentrated around televisits and telehealth. Uh, and obviously, you know, because of COVID primarily, the use of telehealth um, has nearly tripled since 2019 and remote patient monitoring for improved practice efficiencies has also nearly doubled. Um, reducing stress and burnout and in practice inefficiencies has also gained a lot of importance in terms of perceptions around uh, importance for digital tool adoption. So how can we better leverage technology and innovation to support health equity? One vehicle is to bring the power of venture capital. And when I say venture capital, who immediately thinks health equity? Nobody. Um, and Silicon Valley approaches to large intractable problems like removing inequities from our healthcare system. The AMA is great. I love the AMA. We have a wonderful office in Chicago, right on the river, the old IBM building, about a thousand people who work there every day, although you know, it's hybrid now. Um, but it has a particular corporate culture and it is not Silicon Valley. So in 2016, the AMA founded something called Health 2047, harkening back to our founding in 1847. It's a Silicon Valley based for-profit enterprise that is building and commercializing solutions to healthcare challenges and working to improve health equity with the power of venture capital. And so Health 2047 has built, brought together a network of innovators, corporate partners, AMA members from across medicine to identify critical health issues, develop solutions with the sole goal of spinning these off into companies in solutions across a, a number of key areas with improving health equity as an accelerator and a, a unifying theme. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few examples. Um, the folks that we've been able to recruit into this enterprise have decades of experience um, in medicine and public health, AI, machine learning, systems engineering, design thinking. Um, we have the guy who created Siri as one of our advisors. I mean, really, really incredible folks who, who most of whom don't frankly need to work, um, but understand the mission uh, that we are trying to bring forward. Um, and for us, this is a mission play. You know, I, I hope someday the AMA gets some money back from it. That has not happened yet. It may never happen, but if we're able to move the needle, um, that for us is more important than the financial return. Um, to date, the um, enterprise has launched seven or so spinouts. Um, First Mile Care, which is building an affordable, equitable, scalable, sustainable platform to improve the lives of people with chronic disease, to reach marginalized communities across the nation at scale. Um, and it's basically um, Uber for chronic disease management and coaching with on-demand peer-to-peer connection for chronic conditions 
Um, the platform is based on the proven National Diabetes Prevention Program that was developed by the CDC, um, and they are doing really, really well. Um, the only other one I'll, I'll mention, um, just that I can move on, is Zing Health. Zing is a physician-led plan. It's a health plan. It's a Medicare Advantage plan founded by two African-American physicians to meet the needs of Americans underserved and who, who aren't met by existing insurance plans. Um, and what they do is they connect services that are needed by patients um, by putting a patient-physician relationship at the core of a technology-enabled community care model. So um, they basically have this managed Medicare plan started in Illinois, they've expanded to Indiana and Michigan, and I keep trying to get them to Wisconsin, although the insurance commissioner is like a real pain. Um, uh, in targeting vulnerable communities, um, in addition to traditional benefits that all Medicare Advantage plans provide, they provide free dental coverage. They provide free vision coverage. They provide um, free physician telehealth visits, zero cost insulin, zero cost continuous glucose monitors, things that you know if you invest in a community will lead to better health outcomes. Um, and they are not concerned about their bottom line. They're concerned about the health of the communities because they're born out of Health 2047, which is an AMA subsidiary. So anyway, very excited about them. And if you're interested and in learn more about any of these companies, you can go to health2047.com. Okay, um, the last thing I'll mention that's sort of an AMA thing is the uh, Physician Innovation Network. This is a platform. Um, it is a way, it is a free thing online to connect the world of medicine, healthcare innovation by integrating the voice, the clinical voice into technology solutions. It was launched back in 2017, so it's about six years old. It's got 18,000 people on the platform, 30 or so organizational users. I mean, the whole idea is how do we bring clinician perspectives into the technology development lifecycle earlier? Um, and so there have been some real wins out of this platform, companies that have connected with physicians, connected with clinicians, connected with medical students and residents, um, and then brought solutions into the marketplace. Again, the AMA doesn't have any interest in those products. We just want clinical voices um, at the center of the design cycle. Okay, so we all think, and I think believe that AI has some benefit. Um, and there's a lot of buzz around AI right now. Um, and I thought I'd have ChatGPT just write my talk for me, but turns out that my slides were due to Esther well before ChatGPT was a thing. But we know that AI can bring benefits. It can improve outcomes, efficiencies, improve the management of healthcare itself. However, we also know that the implementation of new technologies such as AI can present risks. They can introduce bias, increase inefficiencies, and in some cases, jeopardize patient health and safety. So when I think about digital health technology, I often think about my son, Ethan, my older son. He was born 10 weeks early and weighed two pounds, seven ounces, or 1,100 grams. And he spent 50 days in the neonatal ICU where he required a variety of medical technologies and devices to keep him alive. Technologies and innovations for which my husband and I are eternally grateful. Some of those technologies are more than 100 years old. Warm air incubators were introduced in the 1880s in Paris. Um, other technologies more recently developed like pulse oximetry, which I'll talk about later from the 70s, smart connected infusion pump systems that are wirelessly programmed, have dose error reduction systems, really introduced in the early 2000s. Now, I love sharing pictures of Ethan. I've got thousands. I could talk about them all day long. Um, but I share these pictures of him in the ICU because it reminds me not just of the technologies that work, um, but the dangers associated with those that have failed. Some of you may be familiar with Joel Nobel in the ECRI Institute. Joel was a surgeon and an inventor who founded ECRI in the 1960s outside of Philadelphia after a four-year-old boy literally died in his arms when a defibrillator failed to work. And so he used his institute and his focus and his energy on improving cardiopulmonary resuscitation technology design and deployment and he single-handedly ushered in an era of comparative evaluation of medical device brands 
in models back in the 1970s. There was some very famous work around a series of deaths and injuries to neonates in incubators that ultimately were linked to thermostat failure, caused the incubators to overheat, infants got too warm, and there were design defects that actually led to fires and electrical shock hazards. So I share this as I think about the development and implementation of new technologies, particularly those that are AI enabled, where it can be much, much more difficult to understand when an algorithm is working or when it is not. Now, fortunately, Ethan's incubator worked just fine, uh, kept him warm and toasty, didn't overheat or catch on fire uh, because of the standards and regulations that have transformed the medical device industry over the last 50 years. So this is a, a picture of him on the family trip to the beach last fall, in some ways a modern medical miracle. In other ways, really just the benefit of the seamless integration of routinely available medical device technology. Now much of the AMA's work is currently focused on ensuring that we can have effective digital technologies, devices, standards, and regulations that can protect patients like my son, Ethan, from harm when they're most vulnerable. And I share this as I think about the development of new technologies, again, where it can be much more hard to understand when an algorithm may not be working as expected. Let me now turn to airplanes. The tragic loss of two Boeing 737 MAX airliners provide us some important lessons on how AI systems should and should not be implemented in medicine. Automated systems designed to improve safety can actually create more danger, more harm when they malfunction. And the effect of an AI system is determined by the implementation, not the designer's intent. So the 737 MAX has something called a Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS. And that system appears to have caused both crashes. That system was designed by Boeing as a safety system to mitigate a known problem with the 737 MAX redesign. So modern high efficiency turbo engines are much larger in diameter than the engines used back in the 60s when the 737 was originally designed. So if you mount them in the original configuration, you risk dragging them on the ground. So the 737 MAX redesign made these newer, larger engines fit by putting them forward and higher on the wing. Now, unfortunately, that new engine position can cause the nose of the plane to pitch up during some maneuvers. And if you pitch your airplane's nose up, you can increase the angle of attack. And then if the angle of attack is too large, your wings lose lift and the plane falls out of the sky. You don't want your plane to fall out of the sky. So to mitigate the propensity for dangerous stalls, the 737 was designed with this new safety system, MCAS, to monitor the angle of attack where the plane's nose was. When the system de detects that the angle of attack is too high, it literally forces the plane's nose down, reducing the angle of attack. But if there's a sensor malfunction and it thinks that the plane's nose is pitched up when it's in normal flight, what happens? It forces the plane into the ground. And that appears to be what happened in both of those crashes. How does this relate back to medicine? So when AI systems are added to a medical workflow, the people in the workflow, that's us, have to be aware of the system. We have to receive training on the expected function and potential dysfunction of the system. People working with AI can only supervise and correct it if we know that it's there and what output it is producing. And the flight crews of the two doomed 737 MAXs were not even aware of the existence of this new AI safety system on their aircraft. It was absent from the operations manuals. There was no specific training provided or required. We simply cannot repeat that same mistake in healthcare. So as we think about harnessing the power of AI in medicine, it's really important to recognize upfront that the approach ought to be, how can we boost the capabilities of our clinicians 
and the workforce not replace it. Um, and that's why the AMA has been very adamant in using the phrase augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence when we're talking about these applications in, in healthcare. Now, of course, the AMA is very focused on understanding how we help physicians harness the power of AI in some very specific ways. Um, we've tried to provide a voice in the design and implementation and development of these technologies, providing training resources and support so people can understand what these technologies do and mean. And by doing a lot of work to understand trends, adoption, barriers, costs, things like that. And there's a whole policy compendium around this space that if folks are interested, you can find it. It's all free and, and online. So let me look at a few more perspectives uh, from physicians on AI. Um, we've brought together experts from multiple specialties. Um, and what we hear loud and clear is that AI done right has enormous potential to improve outcomes. There is enthusiasm about disruptive innovation that is clinically validated. Where we hear concerns over and over and over is around lack of transparency that interferes with trust. How are tools designed? How are they validated? How do I know that they're not introducing bias into a workflow and making things worse for my patients? Now, this slide shows, again, more data from that um, digital health survey work, uh, specifically around AI. And what you can see is that one in five physician practices are already incorporating AI in one form or another, mostly on the operations side. Um, one in 10 use biometrics, precision medicine, or digital therapeutics in their practice. But soon, we're going to face hundreds of choices. This is coming. For any given clinical purpose, there will be a dozen tools. And people are excited about that. But we were going to want to choose and deploy tools that actually advance the health of our patients. And so there are a series of questions that are similar to those that physicians ask of any innovation, which are, does it work? Just as we do for drugs or biologics, we wanna see clinical evidence of efficacy and safety so we can rate, you know, weigh the risks and benefits. And then there's some very practical issues for adoption. You know, who's gonna pay for it? Does insurance cover it? Third is who is accountable? And the less transparency about the tool, the less well we can counsel our patients about it, the less responsibility we can take if there are bad outcomes or things like a data breach. Liability for algorithm performance and output is increasingly becoming a top issue for us. And we are seeing proposals from the federal government to hold physicians liable for the output of an AI algorithm in clinical systems. We need to ensure a regulatory framework and system that makes these systems safe and limits the liability exposures for those downstream and places liability with those best suited to mitigate harms, likely the manufacturers. And the final question is, does it actually work in my practice? Applicability, was it deployed, tested in a venue like mine on patients that I see? Um, and there was a proprietary sepsis prediction tool made by a large HR vendor, trained at three hospitals. And when that was independently studied at another large health system, it failed miserably. It found only 7% of the sepsis patients uh, and generated alerts on something like 20% of everybody in the hospital. Um, many of these systems are brittle. They, they don't translate well um, across systems um, and that is a challenge. So you know, do these systems work? Do they provide value? Um, do they actually improve outcomes and improve health equity? I told you I would get back to Pulse Ox, um, and I've got a few minutes, so I'll, I'll, I'll do this and then wrap up. Even in technologies that we take for granted every day, like Pulse Oximetry, there is risk of introducing bias. Um, and if we're not vigilant and demanding in our research and our approach to make sure that these devices uh, and digital technologies work for all patients, they won't. Um, and the recent focus on the fact that pulse oximetry routinely convey inaccurate measurements in patients with darker skin pigmentation should surprise nobody. This has been documented for 30 years. Calibration is the underlying problem here. When these devices were developed in Japan in the 70s, calibration data was not gathered from a diverse 
pool of volunteers. And even though the FDA has long since required medical technology be evaluated on patients from multiple demographic groups, problems persist. There was a well-described study from the University of Michigan that showed that black patients were three times more likely than their white counterparts to have below normal oxygen levels that pulse oximetries failed to identify. Eliminating bias and racial inequities in the design and manufacture of digital tools such as pulse ox and other medical devices is a key part of the AMA's broader strategy to advance racial justice and equity in medicine. And there's one really troubling question that remains unanswered for me. And that is how is it acceptable that after more than three decades, after these discrepancies around skin pigmentation and pulse oximetry were brought to light, that the manufacturers never acted. And I would suggest that that lack of corrective action points to a larger issue of implicit bias in medicine that helps create and sustain barriers to prevent historically marginalized communities from accessing the care that they need. Um, now, physicians and our patients want clinical validation. Um, just like we wanna know the risks and benefits of a new drug, um, we like to see published peer-reviewed evidence to develop trust, that it's safe, that it's efficacious, that there's transparency around it. And unfortunately, um, some of the proposals from the FDA um, actually will not require any evidence for the development of these products, um, but rather they will allow good manufacturing practices um, to uh, lead to product approval. Now, part of transparency is explainability, and we know that AI can't always tell us how it learns something uh, or where it's getting uh, data out of a training set to lead to a decision. Um, but tools that can state what things about a current patient's data are driving a recommendation will be, will be more trusted. And the level of transparency and explainability for a, an algorithm probably that we need is related to the level of risk. So if something's being used to make a clinical decision, uh, if it's a locked algorithm, continuously learning, um, or if it's just something that's being used in the background around operations and management. Um, I'll give you this example, which is, uh, you can find it on the web. Um, this is a Google Derm tool. Um, this is not available in the US, um, but you can get it in Europe. And it's their AI powered Derm tool. Um, and from the website, it says, based on the photos and information you provide, our AI powered dermatology assist tool offers suggested conditions. It's a class one medical device in the EU, not available here in the US. Um, patients are using this. How do we tell, how do I, what do I tell my mother? Uh, when she pulls up Google Derm, takes a photo and it tells her something. Um, there will be no requirement today for these consumer facing products for any regulatory scrutiny. And you can imagine uh, a lot of the challenges uh, if this is not managed well. You know, the key questions for patients, um, patients aren't gonna wanna know the ins and outs of algorithms, but they're gonna wanna know, does it work? Does it work on me with my skin type? my underlying conditions, my age, what happens to my data? Can it be traced back to me? Will my information be sold? What happens when the algorithm evolves and the answer is different on Friday than it was on Monday? And who do I call if there's a problem? Has anyone ever tried calling Google? Yeah, good luck. Um, the consumer facing version of this is a space in its infancy, um, but I would argue that there's a critical opportunity now to think about how do we educate consumers about the questions they need to ask uh, when using these kinds of AI-enabled consumer-facing tools. At the end of the day, we want safe, reliable products in the marketplace that support, not worsen, health inequity challenges. And we need to keep the trust of our patients and our consumers. Um, there are gonna be a lot of assumptions that consumers have about the regulatory framework and oversight and authority of these kinds of tools. And in many cases, those assumptions um, will be wrong. And how do we keep and earn the trust of physicians? Well, we've got to push regulators. We've got to push lawmakers to make sure that there is a clear, consistent regulatory pathway that ensures safety, ensures performance, ensures that these tools do not worsen health equities, health inequities. Um, we need to make sure that we limit our own physician liability um, when we don't have the ability to manage it. Um, and we've got to make sure that we um, build trust for um, these tools. So closing comments, 
Um, these tools, algorithms will transform how we work. There's no question. Um, it's not the human versus the machine. The sum is much greater than the parts. There is tremendous potential to scale our capacity through things like telepresence, virtual monitoring, remote care delivery. But technology will only advance health equity if we are intentional in its design and deployment. And while AI won't replace physicians, physicians who use AI will replace those who don't. Um, I've got two more pictures for you. This is one I took in the OR um, in Milwaukee. Um, I do see patients uh, usually on Tuesdays. Um, and you know, I, I counted this day when I took this photo, I had 36 parameters, continuous parameters that I was monitoring. Lab data coming in from our EHR. What you can see in the back corner is Marshall, our neuromonitoring tech, who's also looking at a whole stream of continuous waveforms. There is so much data. It is unfathomable to me that there aren't things that we miss routinely, that AI overreading, looking at signals couldn't help us be better at our jobs. I know that will happen. I look forward to embracing that transformation. We're not there, but we need to be very, very careful about how those algorithms are introduced, monitored, and who's held accountable for. Um, and this is the family photo to wrap it up. Um, and our one-month-old son, he turned a month on Monday uh, down there at the bottom, Asher. And with that, I would be delighted to take any questions uh, either here in the room or online. Great, thank you so much for a really exciting talk um, and a, a glance of, of the future. Two questions um, about where, what AMA's role is. And I admire you for taking out for, for leadership in that. I feel like it's a bit of herding cats um, for that organization. Um, so one question as a barrier for the expansion of telemedicine and trying to improve access to care is the current requirements for individual state medical licenses. So is the AMA um, helping to advocate uh, to develop a mechanism to eliminate that barrier? Yeah, so um, AMA policy is that regulatory oversight needs to be at the local level. Um, and so our approach has been to try to reduce the friction point around multi-state compact and licensure. Um, but right now, the concern is that if um, we allow uh, a universal license practice across the country, you lose local practice standards and you lose accountability. Um, and we've seen some real challenges in places where that has happened. Um, and I could give you a whole hour about our challenges with the VA system and the lack of oversight related to quality concerns um, in, uh, in that space, as well as some other things on the, on the federal side. So right now the AMA policy is not about um, reducing um, are allowing permissive licensure across states, but trying to make it easier for physicians who want to practice in multiple locations. Um, we have pushed very hard for site origination um, to continue uh, the flexibility that we've had on the public health emergency. Um, and that I think uh, is likely to be successful just given, I think the recognition in Congress as to what that has opened in terms of access for patients. And then the, the second question maybe a little more even, even more challenging. So I know every medical professional society is struggling with um, their sites of the meetings and um, whether they should be in states that are limiting access to reproductive health um, for their uh, patients, for the attendees. Where do you see um, AMA helping uh, in this yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky issue and I see both sides of it. Um, AMA policy is we will not hold meetings that we sponsor in locations with discriminatory policies. Now at the moment, um, that has not taken us into the reproductive health space, um, but we will not go to places that have anti-LGBT laws. So we will not go to Texas, Florida, North Carolina. There's a list, um, the, list the best list is actually maintained by the state of California of all, of all places, but if we're not, because they have similar state restrictions um, that mirror kind of the, the AMA's approach. Um, from an equity standpoint, you know, I, I do struggle with that because I know that our colleagues in those communities need us and need our support. And so um, at the moment, the decision was made to um, 
err on the side of protecting our staff and our members from traveling to those places. Um, but I don't think there's an, an easy answer. I will say on the reproductive um, access side, um, the AMA for our own employees um, made a change to our health plan. So um, we had existing language that allowed folks to travel for needed healthcare service. It was mostly around transplant access, right? If you need to be on a list or go somewhere else, we expanded that for basically any service. So if you don't have the accessibility of any healthcare service within 50 miles or something, we'll pay for the travel and expenses to go out of network. And that's something that we did specifically um, post Dobbs. So Dr. Ehrenfeld, such a wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, we have a question online. Uh, how does AMA input and considerations like these play into devices like smartwatches that aren't medical, but may be used by patients to self-monitor? Yeah, no. So we, we know that um, the whole space of consumer facing digital tools and apps um, is the great wild west. And our CEO about five years ago was, was quoted as describing a lot of these tools as digital snake oil. Um, you know, the most no, the number one downloaded health app uh, for, for a while um, was a blood pressure monitoring app that had no device. It, it, it's a random number generator. Uh, it said in fine print at the bottom just for fun, um, but people downloaded it and they, they used it. And, and God knows what they did with those, those pieces of information. So um, it, it is a challenge. Uh, we continue to have very uh, ongoing conversation. The FDA has no regulatory authority at the moment in that, in that space for most of these um, devices. So, um, you know, our uh, ability to leverage um, that pathway has been uh, limited, but then of course, you know, what we hear from physicians all over is, you know, they get this data thrown at them, dumped at them, sent to them, and they don't have to do. Um, so understanding how do we help um, both consumers understand what's validated, what's real, what's helpful, what's not, and then help clinicians understand how do you deal with the deluge of things that are being that we're being asked to look at and being thrown at us is, is a challenge. There was a, a wonderful, I think it was a New York Times piece, maybe Wall Street Journal recently, um, about the plight of the ski patrol um, with one of the you know, algorithms in the watch that thinks you're in a car crash. And there's something about skiing and stopping that is going off like 30 times a day, like sending a 911 distress signal on the mountain. Um, and they eventually just stopped responding to all of them. So there are these challenges that are, are coming to light and there will definitely be um, pain until we get the real value out of the uh, equation. We have a few more questions online. This next one's from Dr. Barbara Benlin. So she says, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Could there be a place for AI tools to be used by patients, for example, to understand their electronic medical records? Could that be a means to increase equity? And do you know of any research in this area? Um, I am aware of at least one company that's trying to do that. It's basically let me ingest uh, and then you know, ask ChatGPT to explain it to you. Um, it's that kind of concept. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there in the sort of consumer health education space to use these tools to make information more accessible, to improve health literacy. Um, I haven't seen anything that I would point you to that I say uh, is works and is commercializable, um, but there are definitely some exemplars of that. And there are some um, other companies in the publishing space um, that have also uh, been working on that actively. Our last question, since we just have one minute left, this comes from Dr. Shobi Cheda. So she says, thank you for bringing up trust as such a core issue. Uh, what and how do you feel the AMA is doing in garnering trust from our diverse healthcare workforce, including non-physicians? And how is the AMA coming to terms with uh, history as a profession? It's a great question. So if you go and look at the AMA strategic plan around embedding racial equity and justice, um, there is, it's a 53 page document or so. There's a very detailed accounting of that history. And we have to be very honest with where we've been where we didn't just passively stand by and let things happen that were wrong, um, but where we actively opposed things that were right. Um, and that is the first step on that journey towards truth and reconciliation and healing. Um, and that was actually really difficult to read the first time I saw the detail. I mean, the AMA has been around for 175 years. We've, we've done a lot of great things. We've done a lot of things that were terrible. Um, you know, 20 years ago, uh, 30 years ago, um, I could never have been an AMA president um, because I'm gay. 
Um, and so the organization has evolved, um, but coming to terms with that history is an important first step. Um, and we are actually uh, taking steps to pull together um, some working groups around how do we actually get through sort of a, a reconciliation and healing process. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Aaron Phillips. Please give a warm round of applause for fantastic grand rounds.